Thank you, Rachel, and welcome everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here and a real honor to participate on the panel this evening. Um, it's quite an array of activities uh, associated with science at Cal and the Bay Area Science Festival, so we're really delighted here at Citrus to be able to co-sponsor uh, the event tonight and to share the stage with my esteemed colleagues from the physics department. Uh, so just to say a couple of sentences about Citrus, um, as Rachel mentioned, the, the acronym is the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society. So we have been around for about 15 years now. We're one of four institutes for science and innovation that were launched back in 2001 through a grant from the state of California. We're a multi-campus, multidisciplinary research institute. So we're based here at UC Berkeley and Sutarta Dai Hall, but we also have strong connections with partners at UC Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz. So that's the, the network of UC campuses that we're most closely aligned with. Um, before we get started this evening, and we have, I have just a few introductory remarks before we um, get to the, the main presentations from um, Professor Moriyama and Professor Sadele, um, I just wanted to take a step back and you might think looking at this, um, the title for this evening, we're all trained as academics to be quite skeptical, right? transcending global conflict, how basic science unifies the world. Well, that sounds quite idealistic, right? Uh, but let's try to, to um, suspend our skepticism for a little while because I think we will offer some really inspiring examples of how that has happened in the past and then looking toward the future, what the promises of that premise might be, even while we look at perhaps some counterexamples as well. So just to get ourselves um, sort of thinking along these lines before we have some uh, more specific remarks from my colleagues, I want to offer three, um, three examples for us to consider and going historically from immediately post Second World War up through today. So here is just the, the outline of, of this evening as uh, Rachel has already outlined since um, we'll We'll get to your involvement as well uh, later on this evening. So three examples. The Volkswagen Foundation promoting German-Israeli exchange right after the Second World War. The International Commission on Missing Persons, which was established in the aftermath of the Yugoslav conflict. And starting just this year, a new project related to cyber infrastructure um, launched here in California and throughout the Pacific Rim. So thinking about the, the Volkswagen Foundation, I was really interested in preparing for tonight's event to look into this example. I had heard of it in the past, uh, that it was launched in the immediate post-war era through a grant from both the Volkswagen Corporation as well as the Lower Saxony region to promote this um, interaction and research exchange among research scientists between Israel and Germany. At that time, it was, of course, uh, um, unusual and was a, a sort of path-breaking step where scientists, physicists, were able to come and share research projects and work collaboratively toward specific research goals. And since then, the Volkswagen Foundation uh, has an enormous research budget, actually, and even today it offers something like one and a half million euros a year for scientific research. Um, so it's been quite a uh, history in their 50 years since they were started and continues even today. The second example is on the International Commission on Missing Persons. And the scientific angle there is that they have been a real leader in using DNA testing for forensic research. So you'll see... Uh, they have brought together teams from the former, the different factions of the former Yugoslavia to excavate mass graves, to identify remains, and try to identify the missing using DNA technology. So since then, the International Commission on Missing Persons, it's now based in The Hague, and it works on other types of um, disasters, for instance, identifying the missing after the South Asia tsunami, um, including after Hurricane Katrina they were involved, um, and even after the events of 9-11, they um, helped to use DNA technology to identify the missing. But what's pertinent for the discussion this evening is that it really, in the years since then, has been able to bring together 
scientists and families and community organizations from the Serbian, from the Bosnian Muslim community, um, and Croatian communities to join together to identify the missing. Uh, in my role at the Human Rights Center, the faculty director there, Eric Stover, has been quite involved in this effort from the beginning. And he mentioned to me earlier, um, a, a couple of weeks ago, he said in the summer of 2014, so just last summer, he was filming a PBS documentary in Tuzla, Croatia, where he interviewed a Serbian geneticist who was working on the identification of Bosnian Muslim boys and men from the Srebrenica massacre. So 10 years ago, this would have been impossible to imagine. But these days, in part through science, these people from, from different uh, political views and different religious backgrounds are able to come together. So finally, I just want to mention, looking ahead, um, thinking about really the infrastructure of science. Uh, that we have established connections throughout the Pacific Rim recently, um, building on what was already existing in California, to establish high uh, bandwidth, large bandwidth connections throughout the Pacific area. So with connections to Seattle and to Tokyo, and then from there farther abroad, both in Asia and in Europe, that this new system is going to be able to accelerate scientific research in data-intensive scientific fields, including astronomy and astrophysics, um, genetic research, video and uh, visual, um, visual realization and artificial um, visualization uh, throughout this, this area. Uh, this is an effort not only through scientists at, throughout the UC system, but also through the Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And I just want to read a quote from the director of the scientific networking division at the, at the lab. Um, he's also director of the Energy Science Network. Uh, his name is Greg Bell. He says, faster data almost always means faster discovery. More important than bandwidth, though, is a growing spirit of international cooperation in our community. Multiple stakeholders are working together towards a common goal of open, fast, and safe research networking for the world. So it requires not only the humans and the creativity and the inspiration behind the science, but also the basic infrastructure. And this is what we're, we're building here as well. So I'm pleased to introduce my two uh, colleagues, starting with Professor Hitoshi Moriyama. Um, he's a well-known theoretical particle physicist who works broadly on astrophysics, cosmology, and condensed matter physics. He's been a professor at UC Berkeley since 2000 and is also the founding director of the Kavli Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe at the University of Tokyo since 2007. I should say that both of my colleagues really uh, evince this international perspective, which you'll see from their remarks and which we would um, hope to, to promote and encourage also among our listeners, which I'm sure many of you also have that, that background and perspective as well. Um, born in Japan, Hitoshi lived in Germany for four years and in the U.S. for 21 years. He's served on advisory committees around the world and is a multicultural global denizen. In October 2014, as Rachel alluded, he was invited to give a speech at the United Nations headquarters in New York about how science unites people and brings peace. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Professor Moriyama. All right, thank you. Um, you know, the, the Camille made me look, sound like a, a much more important person than I actually am. But anyway, so uh, I wanted to uh, give, me, uh, give some brief remarks about this uh, issue on transcending global conflict, how basic science unifies the world. And as Rachel will remark, I was very honored to be invited to uh, uh, be a keynote speaker at the United States, uh, Nations headquarters in New York. And there was an event called Science for Tea, Peace and Development. And as you can see, uh, I was sitting at the same table as Kofi Annan, which I don't think will ever happen again. Uh, and, and I just would like to give you a context to how this event happened. And that had to do with a, a European laboratory called CERN. And the CERN is a European particle physics laboratory and had been around already for 60 years. They wanted to have an anniversary. And the CERN has been so successful in really literally uniting people from all over the world to work together. So CERN was granted actually an observer status at the United Nations. So that's why United Nations and CERN worked together to put together this event. 
And you might know CERN from a great discovery that was announced three years ago of something called the Higgs boson that made really uh, amazing news worldwide. And uh, so it's doing really basic research, trying to understand how the universe works at all. But another thing that is probably less known about CERN is that it was founded in the aftermath of the World War II in Europe in a devastating situation. And there was an intent to unite people from Europe after this tremendous devastating wars among nations in Europe. So the CERN was founded from the desire to really bring people together from, you know, who used to be arch enemies, and then now they can work together. And as a result, it became very successful in that. Uh, right now, uh, there are so many people coming from all these nations in the world coming to CERN, working together, and you can immediately spot that the India, Pakistan, uh, Ukraine, and Russia, um, uh, say uh, Israel and Egypt and so on. So all these people coming from you know countries which are in political conflicts, sometimes even wars, come to CERN, work together, and and that's really an amazing thing. And so that's the theme they wanted to put together, United Nations, and they chose four speakers, two politicians. The senior politicians was Kofi Annan, the former uh, the Secretary General of UN. Another politician, a science minister of South Africa. They also chose two scientists. The senior one is a Nobel laureate, Carl Rubier, and the junior one was little me. So that was the, the composition of the panel. But anyway, so this is the way CERN has been really uh, contributing to the world peace in a way that people coming from you know, nations in, in really serious conflict really do come together and, and work together. And they bring up that memory back to their home countries. And there has been, of course, a very positive impact, I believe. And uh, uh, the CERN is also a birthplace of the World Wide Web, if you uh, haven't heard this before. So the CERN really wanted to integrate people working together, so that's why they had to share data among people coming from different nations, and that's how web was invented, which of course spread out for all purposes these days, especially in business. So uh, the CERN has been producing many good things, as you can see. So what I'd like to do next is that, you know, I rehearsed so much before this event in United Nations. I don't think I can do better than that. So what I'm going to do is just show you the video of my speech. <laughs> not an 
amazing place. In my scientific career in Berkeley, California, I have worked with many colleagues and friends who have been caught in various conflicts or suffered persecutions. I worked with an Israeli who witnessed the suicide bombing a block away from his home, a Serb whose village was bombed by NATO, an Iranian who fled the Islamic Revolution on foot to Turkey, a Russian who fled his country because of his Jewish origin, and a Ukrainian whose mother had to flee Crimea. I have worked with these people for a very simple reason, because we had a common goal, namely to solve the mysteries of the universe. I firmly believe that basic scientific research is a true peacemaker for the humankind. I am sure every one of you here today has this experience. You look up at the beautiful night sky, watch the stars, and suddenly, your mind is filled with all these profound questions about the universe. The all of the beautiful universe make differences in cultures, languages, colors, genders, religions, and ideologies simply disappear. We live on a tiny piece of rock called the planet Earth that circles around an average star called the sun in a rural area 27,000 light years away from the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which is only one out of a hundred billion galaxies in the visible universe. If you see the big picture, our differences seem so small. This perspective makes me think differently about all the wars, conflicts, tragedies, poverty, and diseases we read in newspapers every day. There must be a way for us human species on this tiny piece of rock to work together. CERN embodies this idea that basic science unifies people from all nations. I serve on its scientific policy committee that reports to its governing body, the Council. Even though neither of my countries, Japan nor the United States, are a member state of CERN, <coughs> CERN only cares about my scientific expertise not about where I'm from or how much my country is paid. During my numerous stays at CERN, I've seen people from India and Pakistan, Israel and Iran, Russia and Ukraine working together. I was told, even at the height of the Cold War, CERN brought scientists from both sides of the Iron Curtains working together. These days, thousands of people from friendly or warring nations come to CERN and build amazing scientific instruments. Some of them discovered the Higgs boson in 2012, has been mentioned already several times in this session, nearly after nearly half a century of hunting. By the way, this Higgs boson is very important to all of you. It fills the entire universe, and it is keeping your body from evaporating in an atmosphere. I recently listened to a talk by my colleague Eliezer Rovinovich from Jerusalem on a project in Jordan called Sesame, which Council President already mentioned earlier. This is a project where the governments of Bahrain, Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Pakistan, and Palestinian Authority and Turkey are working together to build a new particle accelerator as an intense light source for basic research in biology, material science, and medicine. Eliezer said, quote, in our region, the wars are not over. There are different perspectives on who won and who lost, who won yesterday and who wins tomorrow. Eliezer also said, Sesame actually started in Sony cafeteria where the initial idea was hatched, like so many other science projects. Towards the building of an international laboratory for Sesame, designed based on the CERN model, but tailored to the nations involved, required many negotiations and compromises. I was glad to learn that Berkeley, as well as Japan, provided the project with help to go over some big hurdles. He also emphasized the importance to generate public awareness of the project because, quote, people don't believe Israelis, Arabs, Iranians, Pakistanis can work together. They are cynical about projects in the Middle East. But now, the light source is expected to be ready in late 2015 to prove that optimism wins and literally for see people to see the light. So, CERN, I'm very impressed, has a history of uniting people in quests that have nothing
nothing to do with power, but everything with knowledge. I also believe that the quest for knowledge and the fascination with the mystery of the universe will be the key to development. This is because the fascination with stars and planets and outer space gets the children excited about learning more about science. If you nurture their curiosity properly, it leads to a more educated and scientifically minded population. To raise the standard of living requires scientific knowledge to all people. Everybody needs to understand the resources available on our planet are finite and not very much for billions of us. My friends in America need to accept that we are responsible for climate change and recent natural disasters. We need to convince still some skeptical people in West Africa that threat of Ebola is real. My fellow Japanese should understand what the nuclear incidents in Fukushima really mean. And this development, based on curiosity for Mother Nature, can start with just looking up the night sky and sharing the awe of beautiful universe. Again, CERN embodies this type of science. I read that this excitement with the discovery of Higgs boson increased the enrollment of high school students in science by 20% in Europe. CERN brings in thousands of students and high school teachers every year. They witness people from all over the world working together peacefully to solve the most profound mysteries of the universe we live in. They bring their stories back to the classrooms and beyond. They simply get excited. And this excitement is contagious. I myself play a small part in getting young people excited about science. Several years ago, the University of Tokyo asked me to start an international science institute in Tokyo to attract young and ambitious scientists from around the world. I raised five basic questions I've always wondered about from my childhood. How did the universe begin? What is this made of? What is its fate? What are its basic laws? And why do we exist in it? These questions resonated well with scientists from all cultures. We attract nearly a thousand job applications to about 10 positions we can offer every year. Now 60% of the members are international, roughly equally split among Asians, Americans, and Europeans. And we have our own Russians, Ukrainians, Chinese, and Indians working together. Also, I've lectured the students from developing countries many times. Recently, I've given online lectures on a research on the universe and attracted 75,000 people from 150 countries. They are from all over. Many of them are from the US, Europe, and Japan, but also from Pakistan, Western Sahara, the Bahamas, and Swaziland. They get all excited to see the science now addresses these truly basic questions of humankind. And this way, they grow up knowing the methodology of scientific approach. This, I believe, is the key to make sure that the future of whatever nation you are from can rest on the scientifically minded population. I believe the world needs more places like Sun. Personally, I'd love to see the United States and Japan or similar international organizations for basic research, where people from all around the world come together. It will surely open up local population to global mindset, especially the children. I am eager to make sure that science contributes to peace and development of the entire planet. To make it clear that the institute I found in Japan is open to anybody irrespective of their origins, I named it the Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe. Laws of physics and mathematics that describe these laws are not only applicable to the entire planet Earth, but also throughout the whole universe. One day, I hope to see a job application from a different planet. I will think it's only a matter of time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention.
So anyway, so that was a speech, and I was very really glad to hear that Rachel was impressed by it, and so that she wanted to host this event. Just to give you a little uh, sort of uh, uh, extra remarks on this, this is where the Sesame Project is located, right in the midst of Jordan. And Israel, Egypt, Iran, Pakistan, Turkey, Cyprus, Bahrain are really working together. They signed the same document to support this project. And uh, as we speak, uh, this uh, accelerator they were building is now in operation, and scientific use is starting sometime soon. And also, uh, the, I was uh, able to talk to a bunch of scientists at CERN who had experience right after the war. And for example, the stories I heard was kind of interesting. For example, the Jorah Mickenberg is a, an Israeli physicist. And he actually ended up working in Germany uh, after the World War II. And that's very hard to imagine. Israel and Germany, they are true arc enemies uh, uh, after the Holocaust. That happened so sort of terrible thing. But it turned out that there were special needs why Israeli scientists really had to work in German laboratory called DAISY. So they actually went all the way up to the top. And all these requests that they would like to work together went up to Adenauer and Ben-Gurion in those days before any diplomatic relations have started between these two countries. And only a couple of years later, they actually signed a, uh, a, a peace treaty. So the scientists really led the way to peace between these really uh, the nations in a serious, serious conflict and the uh, hostility. And he has also given me a bunch of pictures at CERN how Israelis and Palestinians are working together. You see Israeli flag and Palestinian flag over here. Another example of Israelis and Pakistanis working together. So this is the way the uh, scientists can really come from uh, nations which are in a serious political conflict, but nonetheless they can work towards this common goal. And a place like this, and also the basic science in general, can really promote this idea that irrespective of where you're from, once you share the same goal, you can work together. And I'd like to just finish up by showing one beautiful picture I love. This is a picture taken by a Japanese space probe that went to the other side of the moon and started to slowly come back and have watched the Earth rise on the lunar surface. And this is where we live. So this is the little blue tiny piece of rock I mentioned in my speech. You can see this on this rugged uh, surface of, this, uh, of the moon with craters and everything. And this is where all we are. So we are literally on the same boat, and the basic science does provide this kind of perspective and also tools for people to work together. So this is what I want to actually uh, uh, talk about in my remark. Thank you. Thank you, Hitoshi. So I'll provide a brief introduction to Professor Sadele and then um, proceed with his remarks. Uh, he was a graduate from Ecole Polytechnique and a Doctor of Science from Paris Orsay University um, by training an elementary particle physicist. He's participated in two prestigious experiments that led to Nobel Prizes, the Mark I experiment at SLAC and UA1 at CERN also. Um, in 1984, he decided to shift his efforts toward particle astrophysics and cosmology and came to UC Berkeley in 1985 when he was appointed professor of physics here. Uh, he was also the director of the Center for Particle Astrophysics. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. What I really appreciate about his approach uh, and what I think you'll hear in his presentation and in the discussion afterward is his openness to interdisciplinary approaches and his real commitment to uh, a broader understanding of science from K through 12 level and outreach to the community to improve scientific understanding among um, people who might not have that expert grounding that he does. So please join me in welcoming Professor Sadley. Camille for these kind words. So what I was thinking I would do, since I basically agree totally with Hitoshi, uh, that I will try to add two dimensions. OK, there is a dark side of science, which is weapons. So how do we deal with that? And secondly, uh, the second dimension that I would like to 
uh, approach is actually was attributed to already by Ikoshi. What can we do together on global issues, which are clearly uh, uh, will be at the key, the key for the peace in the world in the future. So. Uh, Okay, so basically I agree with Doshi. I was in the staff member at CERN uh, for 15 years. In my group, we were five Bernard support. Uh, and one was from Hungary, one one was from Czechoslovakia, one was from uh, Germany, one from France, and one from England. <laughs> and this was actually difficult times because this was the old war I'm speaking of the early 70s or the late 60s. Okay. And as a, when I came back to CERN in the mid 70s, I was a, as a senior staff, I was appointed to a, a committee, a very official committee of collaboration between CERN or Europe and the Soviet Union. Half of the committee members were KGB. <laughs> and I think, in spite of that, we had actually a fairly significant role in trying to, in, in the human rights issues. Two of our colleagues, uh, Olaf and Chansky, were uh, in prison at that time in, in Russia, and finally uh, they were released. Okay, so. The dark side is, of course, the first application of physics science, of science in general, is weapons, is the instruments of war. It's the new Archimedes uh, that was also, also already there. Uh, and so how do you think about that? And I think we are divided. And there are three camps. Okay. Uh, some of us decide to work decide explicitly to work on issues of defense. Okay? A food has from Darba, for instance, or, or uh, the, office, the office of the office of liberal uh, uh, <coughs> research. Uh, some of my colleagues are spending a month every summer uh, consulting with the military what is called the Jason Group. Okay. Uh, and there are two arguments which I respect. One is the contribution to the security of this nation. And the other one is that uh, when we have very dangerous things such as nuclear weapons, we better uh, control what is happening there. Uh, I have actually uh, great respect from uh, uh, two scientists who were close friends of mine. Uh, one disappeared, uh, 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 Wolfgang Adoski, and the one is still alive, uh, 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 prestigious theorist uh, Citrell, who were among the scientists who really made the sort arguments a possibility. The sort argument of arguments uh, basically uh, regulate regulated the decrease of nuclear weapons on both sides in the Soviet Union and in the US. By the way, they are about to be renewed and it's uncertain what happens. Okay. Uh, some of my colleagues are only uh, a money science the Secretary of Energy, uh, a basic uh, scientist, uh, uh, were very active in the Iran agreement. Uh, and this knowledge and knowledge of a number of countries that in part of energy are very into reaching this Now, some others, like me, uh, have made the decision that we want to work on uh, classified research. Okay, there is a moral stand there. There is also this conviction that maybe uh, that's not necessarily the most effective way uh, at the moment for peace. Uh, and uh, and we would like to, as I think Doshi focus on these fundamental uh, questions which unify us and modify our vision of ourselves and our place in the world. It's very difficult to think about conflict when we see this this uh, uh, picture. 
fish of the moon rising. The fish of the earth rising over the horizon of the moon. Okay. Now, unfortunately, a large fraction of our community does not make the, the choice very explicitly and actually more, more accepts or compromises uh, uh, to and get basically there is money there, there is interesting problem to solve and accept money without thinking too much about it. Okay. So, uh, we are part of the University of California, and as you may know, uh, we are managing two national labs. Two, three national labs, but two are weapon labs. And those are the most uh, So, what do we, how do we think? Can we think about that? Uh, actually, the management of the use of, uh, of the labs was supported by a vote of the UC faculty in 2004, not very large participation, 27%, a very large majority, 67%, if I remember uh, in favor. And the two arguments were uh, service to the nation, uh, trying to uh, for the quality of the science, the science and the scientists. But there was a later condition uh, that this was not up to use to manufacture weapons uh, even maintain them. Uh, and that's how we got into partnership with the in a cooperation and plus uh, and they are responsible for managing the, the, the weapons side and they are more My own position, and I should say that I am a member of one of the overseeing committees of the labs for the Academic Senate. I'm not sure that they are totally effective. They are actually uh, uh, tremendous difficulties in this limited uh, uh, cooperation, uh, difference of culture with Bechtel, and our overseeing agency, the nuclear, National Nuclear uh, Safety Agency. Of the UE as such a, a focus on compliance, but it is very difficult to have scientific life in such a, uh, environment. Okay, so we are trying to see what we are can do. The second part that I will suggest is that actually we should put, we should not focus on the weapons. Okay. They are really much more important issues uh, that we need to deal with. Otherwise, the world will explode. Okay. What about climate change? Okay. What about water? Related, of course. Related issues of food and poverty. What do we do about terrorism? Uh, religious and ethnic politicism. Okay. All these questions are very central and are very important to our security. And are not defense questions in the traditional sense, but I, I do believe are important for uh, this, not only our national security, but international security. Okay. So, so uh, in that sense, I'm, I'm actually in favor of trying to attack this kind of question, global questions, uh, the best minds, uh, both at the university and at the house. So that's how I think a little bit about these issues. So, uh, we have more, you know, more choice to make, and I'm not saying you should be one way or the other. And in the case of the university, it's simply to be clear that we have a vision in that. But probably in broader sense than just the Okay, so, so, so what, what can we do as a basic scientist? Okay. And then I will come back to some of the things in the second half.
culture. And we should not forget to it. It's not our responsibility to look at the application of science. That's the problem of society. That's not our problem. I don't particularly agree with that. The third aspect is the opposite. It's that we have the solution. We know the optimal way of solving the problems. And problems are very multidimensional. Info. 
point to or, or suggest other mechanisms for thinking about um, how science can bring um, people together from perhaps previously conflicting uh, groups or, or countries if you want to speak to them. Uh, one example that comes to my mind is a uh, place in Trieste, Italy, called the uh, uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics. And uh, this happened when a Pakistani physicist, Abdul uh, uh, Salam, was received the Nobel Prize in Physics. And that was probably the first time when a physicist from the third world uh, received the Nobel Prize. So he actually worked with UNESCO to found an institute specifically for the purpose of bringing young people from the third world and have an experience working with the uh, leading scientists. And uh, so that was actually an amazing uh, phenomenon. So I actually once invited to give lectures there for two weeks. And, and literally, I saw people from all around the world, mainly from Africa and the Central Asia, and they really come to this place and, and, and have access to uh, what's going on in cutting edge science. They get very inspired to go back to the country and, of course, spread the word out about this. So, uh, uh, so this is a way uh, one single organization can really promote uh, sort of science as a tool to promote the collaboration among different countries and uh, also inspire the next generation. I will agree. I actually also, I knew it a bit sad, and uh, I went twice. Oh, great. I have never met him, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so both of you in your um, positions as professors, you're advising students, probably graduate students, undergrads, or postdocs. What would you say to them? Does this uh, idea come into your conversations with them about broadening their perspective in this international way, or what kind of advice would you give them? Well, so one thing I'm doing is I actually work both in Japan and in Berkeley now. And so uh, I bring many of my students from Berkeley over to Japan, spend some time there, where they also get exposed to different kind of people, different cultures, different languages, different ways of thinking, with different approaches in science. And so uh, that kind of exposure, they really seem to appreciate. And they tell me explicitly that that really broadened up their mind. So just having more experience like that is a very small thing. But I think it's a very important thing, especially at a young uh, age of uh, my students. And so that's at least one way I'm trying to promote that idea of a more international perspective and collaboration. There is, I'm trying to discourage this idea that if after the graduation they go to Europe or to uh, Japan, they will, uh, they will be uh, forgotten, mm -hmm. uh, which is the kind of big worry that they have. Uh, and, um, uh, but those, while, while they are students, I encourage them to go uh, to scientific conferences. That's where you have to collaborators, close collaborators are, who happen to be in France, so we also send them to France. We spoke earlier a little bit about the study abroad program, so even for undergraduates, uh, it seems that STEM majors are increasingly participating in study abroad programs, um, whereas before it might have been difficult to incorporate that time abroad into their required curriculum, that uh, increasingly it's becoming more possible because of changes in the, the requirements or universities understanding um, the importance of having that kind of international perspective. And perhaps, I don't know if it could even be tied to the, the Berkeley Global Campus, you know, if we're um, being able to nurture this kind of international collaborative research right here at Berkeley. I think that's one of the aims of that campus as well. Yes, uh, and it goes the other way. Uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm in charge of a program which is called Berkeley Connect mm -hmm. in physics, where we are trying to Okay, as in two, ten other departments, we are trying to connect the formal courses to the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, there are at least uh, five students in this group, uh, I think 50 students, but five students uh, who are from the world mm -hmm. and are here just for six months. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but then they ask us whether they can get involved in research. And that starts with difficulty. You know, it, uh, it's very difficult to find a group who can uh, who invest in a student just to have them disappear. Uh, That's true. Berkeley um, does attract a lot of international students, so we um, provide that perspective here at home. Um, but it's also good to 
figure out how we can encourage the U.S. students to, to get the perspective from abroad. Well. Yeah, so really going abroad is, is an essential part of life, I'm sure, the, uh, the young students. I myself uh, really want many thanks. For example, I was uh, invited to be on a, a school in India for two weeks. Yeah. And that's when I experienced that, you know, if I want to get any laundry done, I'm supposed to leave my laundry on a porch of the laboratory and somebody would come and pick them up they told me. And clearly, they are the untouchable people. I'm not supposed to see them. And I ask around, you know, how do I pay them? Well, leave the money there. It's a safe country, nobody takes money. But nonetheless, I'm not supposed to see them. So this kind of experience really sort of, uh, you know, was sort of kind of shocking, but at the same time, really revealing to me that the kind of system we are familiar with and accustomed to is by no means should be taken for granted. Yeah. We really need to appreciate what we got, but at the same time, we can work together with them to at least uh, uh, change their mindset to some extent. So uh, uh, there are so many things you learn by just going out there rather than being here. Yeah. So the students really need to do that. Absolutely, that's a good example. Uh, I was wondering if you had thoughts. We had talked about uh, the role of the universities, the role of the international organizations like the UN, or um, professional societies of scientists and such, and promoting this idea of transcending global conflict. I wondered if you had thoughts about the role of the industry or corporations in um, trying to also achieve those goals, or if they were working against those goals, or the things that we could do to mitigate the effects of that. Uh, I'm sure industry can also be a great help in uh, more global collaboration, but I think there is also a catch. Um, so, one thing though, which is sort of great about basic science is it's totally useless. <laughs> Namely, that there's no sort of vested interest by nations in uh, sort of keeping the results of the research secret. And that's why we can really work together for people from anywhere in the world. For corporations, there's definitely vested interest because they have to make money and some of the things they can share with companies from other countries and so on. So I think the, uh, in, in terms of being more free uh, to exchange ideas and work together, uh, the, the science is actually one very good tool. So is art, music. Yes. Now, of course, uh, some of these companies are very international, and then they need a really uh, managers in each of the countries which you know the culture and so on. So they are also looking for people with more uh, uh, international training in some sense. That's great. Um, I'm going to move to a few of the questions from our audience um, and see what your response would be. Um, so thinking again, perhaps beyond the basic science, more in the as the continuum between basic to apply, there's sort of a, a range. Um, and some of the programs here on campus, like Big Ideas at Berkeley, try to promote the application of scientific ideas to address poverty and other humanitarian kind of issues. Um, are there thoughts from your perspective about how science can make a difference, uh, perhaps farther downstream in, in those applied areas? OK, so I'm working in cosmology. So it's yeah. difficult to see the application. <laughs> but either way, that matter won't be used as an energy source for some time. Uh, but uh, I did uh, speak about uh, spin-offs, possible of instrumentation, for instance. But I hope that I, I can also encourage my students to follow uh, their interests. And and basically, um, uh, either professionally or by volunteering, try to put their expertise at the service of, uh, of uh, uh, for instance, de developing countries. Uh, you can hear your whole thinking about, uh, for instance, these groups in the engineering not being designing. Uh, the small uh, ovens. The stoves, the cook stoves, uh, yeah. yes. Also through the labs, the projects through the yeah. national mm -hmm. yeah. And these are very important efforts because uh, 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 for development, uh, for developing countries, it's in, it, in the villages, you, the, the big technologies that, that do not necessarily apply. Yes, we, they are actually small companies. Uh, or big companies selling uh, solar batteries, which are making, uh, changing a little bit the conditions. And that's a best technology that put at the disposal of 
think as theoretical physicist, I give it less useful than we're now in terms of applications. Uh, so, but many students who uh, got out of my research group actually end up for talking for uh, finances and so on. So, but what you know, they they're not really solving the world uh, the, the uh, <coughs> problem, the, the world peace directly. But uh, the, seeing people like them, uh, what I uh, I believe what I'm seeing is that once they are trained well in some scientific research, at least they grow in a mindset of thinking straight, logically, rationally, and scientifically. And, and so they eventually become the problem solvers one or the other way. So if they are okay and motivated to uh, solve these important problems now facing society or in the world, I, I, I'm sure they can be effective that way. So uh, uh, no, I, I don't have any anecdote to share with you because I don't have examples about this, but I, I, I'm convinced at least that, uh, that, that having students you know, going through this uh, wonderful academic institution and, and together with more international exposure and, and getting interested in these problems, uh, they can be very effective in problem solving and problem can be world peace or the way versus uh, making money, so it depends on where they go, but I'm sure they, the learning how to think mm -hmm. is probably the most important thing for these young people. Yeah. That's definitely a necessary skill and uh, applicable across a range of contexts. Um, so I, I, I actually had one thing uh, which is, I think is important. We have to not only train people in the scientific discipline, we have to help them connect that to the public picture. And, uh, and that means we may not do enough of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what perfectly connects. Right. That, that uh, was one question that we had discussed earlier, is how to bring in other disciplines. So obviously there are strengths that science and scientific research can bring to big questions like world peace or uh, conflict resolution. What, how would you suggest um, collaborating with the social sciences or the humanities? Well, for example, they take this example of the nuclear power we now brought up, and uh, you know, my home country, Japan, we suffered from this major uh, issue with the uh, uh, nuclear power plants lately, after the major earthquake. And, and so that actually was a very important lesson for many of us scientists. Um, so the, unlike in the case of France, from what I got now told me, uh, the process in Japan of accepting a nuclear power was fairly democratic. Local people can really vote, and, and governments can make decisions on these things. But you know, they were actually criticizing here that nuclear power is absolutely safe. And if you think about any power sources, nothing is absolutely safe. Uh, the fuel, fossil fuel power plants can explode, dams can break, and, and then everything comes with risk. And uh, so, but sort of politicians sort of overrode this uh, possible sentiment against it by promising it's absolutely safe. And I'm sure some scientists also got involved in making statements like this. So after this incident, the scientists were blame the scientists were basically deceiving people. And, and that came as a big shock to uh, uh, many of us. So the scientists have to be, you know, of course, completely open. And the scientists don't have any uh, 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 magic bullet for solving any of these problems. But rather, what we can do is to openly share information about what we know and also about what we don't know, because many things about the effect of radiation is actually not known. And, and be clear about what's true, what we are not sure about, what's wrong, and, and be engaged in dialogue. And eventually, uh, in any democratic society, people have to vote, and then make decisions on the direction of society. So this engagement, I felt at the end of the day, was the most important thing. Scientists are not providing solutions, but not already said that. But we share information, uh, and then the people would decide. And that's what democracy is about. So this is the way things should be done. And so that's the lesson I learned. Mm -hmm. That's uh, another question, actually, is um, and, and a question for you. To what extent do you encourage your students or your colleagues to engage in these kind of ethical questions? You laid out the three camps that uh, regarding to, to participate in the research that could lead to weaponization, for instance. To what extent do you encourage your, your students or colleagues to think about making a conscious choice about that? And how do you or do you encourage them to um, convey those decisions or that thought process to the public? 
that's a very big question. <laughs> you know, I being born in Japan, coming to Berkeley, and, and watch that uh, how my patent project was born out of this place was of course a very mixed feeling about it. And and uh, but clearly the, the scientists involved here, Oppenheimer, Mattel, and so on, were really motivated by uh, 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 avoiding Nazi acquiring nuclear weapons and basically destroying the world. The U.S. has to get hold of that weapon first, make sure that didn't happen, and it didn't happen. Uh, uh, so this kind of motivation is actually very pure and noble, and I respect that. So I don't think there is a very simple answer to this question whether we should be involved in this kind of research or not, and ultimately it's an individual decision. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, the students have to learn how to think about this on their own. I, I can't tell them uh, the answer to this question. And so, so uh, that, that, again, that's the way we should uh, uh, train students. Mm -hmm. I, I had some experience uh, with Maybe first, uh, let me say that I would have probably worked on the Manhattan Project if I had not been born at that time. Uh, the, uh, so it's, there is not an absolute answer, depends on the situation. Um, but believe it or not, uh, the, the physics department at Berkeley could not speak about those questions. For a long time. When I joined the faculty in 1985, it was a deadlock. It was a taboo subject. Yeah. Because, uh, of course, you know, Oppenheimer was coming from the physics department at Berkeley, that, that, that was no particular comment uh, for that. But then there was Ed Teller, who was also a, 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 a person who, in a concern in the department and so on. And the, 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 the passions over the years have vested. And when I try to bring this kind of questions to a faculty meeting uh, as a young faculty member, I was basically understood that this was not the kind of things that my colleagues were ready to speak about here. Now, a year ago, I'm sorry to come back to Berkeley Connect. Uh, decided that as part of the general training of our other candidates, we should probably have a discussion on that. And I organized a panel, which was very well attended, including by some faculty members of the department, and, and where we discussed basically this, issue, this kind of issues. And I had put together a, a panel where there were people very much engaged and people very much engaged but the other way. Uh, and, and this was actually a very positive discussion. Even uh, some of the uh, uh, people with extreme positions were in the, the usual, uh, usual position were in the audience actually participated in a very constructive way the discussion. So there is a discussion which is possible yeah. and we should do more of that. Yeah. In the US at least for um the political rhetoric is often anti-science, so or skeptical of, of scientific findings. And I'm wondering if you have advice for politicians or or voters um, about how we might be able to increase the voice of science into the political process. Are there, say, advisory committees or other kind of mechanisms that you would recommend or think would be effective? Well, I'm sure there are many avenues, but one thing is we need to build up trust. Mm -hmm. The scientists are not being trusted, I'm afraid. So what scientists tell people, like for example, global climate issues, but some people take that as, you know, not just with a grain of salt, but outright lie. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a very strong disconnect between scientists and uh, uh, some people in the uh, general population. And, and so one thing, at least I, I'm trying very hard on, is to do more outreach in terms of trying to get people to understand the way scientists, what excites scientists to begin with, what are the problems we're trying to solve, but also uh, give them an idea on how scientists operate and how science operates, and so that they have at least better idea on, you know, when scientists say something, where they're coming from and what they're interested in, how they're approaching the problems, so and to build up better trust. And, and I think this is really the most fundamental thing and it has to be done really at the human-to-human -human level. Any sort of organization
organizations and communities, all these things, of course, are sort of structure built on us. And I don't think they will be ever able to really build a, a true trust between the uh, general people and scientists. And, and if, uh, what I can do is very limited, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. But at least, uh, we, if we don't do this, we are doing a kind of disservice. So that's something I deeply care about. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking from the UN was a good uh, platform for extending. At least had a big audience. Bernard, did you have I'm not sure I have a message from for the politicians, except to try to understand what the scientists are saying in terms of facts, and not use the scientists against each other. Mm. Uh, uh, I have more message, messages to my co to my colleagues. I think the more humble we are in trying to explain what we know and what we don't know, mm -hmm. uh, the more trust there will be. Mm -hmm. the, the arrogance of, of some scientists actually make it very difficult to be trusted. Well, we're coming to the last few minutes. I wondered if you wanted to offer any um, closing thoughts or remarks on how science can uh, transcend global conflict.